If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Romans chapter 2. We are going through the book of Romans. It's a series uh, in Romans, and we go verse by verse. That's just the way I do. Uh, that's the way I was taught. Uh, folks, I was raised with some of the greatest preachers and evangelists, especially at Cameron Baptist Church in Lawton, Oklahoma. I'm talking Bailey Smith. I'm talking Manly Beasley. All right, there's Jerry Vines. There's, there was, I, got, I got to see all these guys that were just amazing. Sam Cathy, pulpiteers. And so uh, I, I just, I've had a good balance in life. And, and I thank God that He has allowed me to do this as long as I have. But uh, in Romans chapter 2, and if you have a bulletin and want to follow along with us, I want to talk to you today about false security. False security. And the outline in the bulletin, number one, false security of heritage, of heritage, of who you are or where you have come from. That can be false security. The second one is false security of knowledge. Knowledge, okay? And, and there's nothing wrong with knowledge. I'm a graduate of Oklahoma Baptist University, and I'm proud of that degree. But I'm simply saying knowledge will not save you. Matter of fact, I heard an evangelist say there are people 12 inches from heaven. 12 inches. That's from their head to their heart. And folks, that is so true. Number three, false security of ceremony. Okay, ceremony is, is a lot of tradition. Okay, tradition. And Paul speaks uh, to these issues uh, in the second chapter of Romans. You know, people in today's world long for security in their lives. Uh, many people also deal with fear daily because of not being secure in certain areas of their lives. Some specific areas that people worry about are economic security, job security, marital security, health security, home security, and even national security. The Apostle Paul in our text uh, today is talking about eternal security. Folks, I know no better security than eternal uh, security, knowing that when you die, you are going to heaven. You have to realize, folks, God's promises are true. They are true. And if he says you can know, 1 John 5 or, or 13 says, these things are written that you may know that you have eternal life. And you can know that. Most people do not want to talk about death or God's judgment, uh, but we all must come face to face that everyone will see death unless the Lord tarries. Some people build up a false sense of spiritual security by trying to convince themselves that they are good enough to get into heaven, like a works uh, security. And folks, my question is, there's always somebody working harder than you or more than you are, so you have to take that into consideration. They somehow believe that their good will outweigh their bad, and they're pretty sure they will make it into heaven. And, and I get that when I uh, witness to folks are you going to heaven? Well, I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm going. Well, folks, you don't want to be pretty sure. You want to know that you are going. Paul will share three false securities uh, that many of the Jewish leaders believed in writing in Romans chapter 2. Let's look at what God's holy word says about these three issues. And our main point today is the difference between religion and righteousness. Folks, religion will not get you into heaven. Attending a church will not get you into heaven. A baptismal certificate will not get you in heaven. All right? The only thing that's going to get you into heaven is knowing Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. And to be honest with you, Paul cuts to the chase. I mean, he said some really good things uh, in the text that we have already covered. But here... It's almost like he switched gears and he started thinking about the Jewish leaders, about how they treated Jesus Christ and how they thought because they wore the religious garb because they had the law and they could, they could memorize the law that they were more superior than others. Folks, we are all sinners and we all need God's grace and mercy in our lives. So let's look at uh, Romans 2, verse 17. Indeed, you are called a Jew. And 
We know that the Jews were God's chosen people. We know that God chose them special. It goes back to Abraham, and, and he was the father of faith. We know that God penned the law. The law was the Ten Commandments, and later on, uh, the Old Testament. We know that they, they had a special place in God's heart. And what some of these Jewish leaders were thinking is, because of their heritage, because they were a Jew, because they were raised under the law, because uh, maybe even their father was a priest or, or a religious leader, that they were going to get into heaven. And, and Jesus really let them know that that is not what it takes. Uh, just because you are Jewish doesn't mean you're going to heaven. Folks, we all go the same way. The cross, the, 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 the ground at the cross is level. Everyone must come through Jesus Christ our Lord. And we know that our heritage uh, is, is important. We know that God has placed us in families, and we understand all that. But it has nothing to do with salvation. They were called the Israelites. They spoke Hebrew. They knew the law. But folks, I am telling you, that is not what gets you into heaven. I don't care if your father was a preacher, if he was a deacon, if your parents taught Sunday school, that doesn't make you saved. Okay? This is what Jesus is saying. Hold your finger there and go with me to John 8. Jesus had some, some things to say about this crowd. John 8, verse 31. And Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So he's saying there are Jewish disciples, there are Jewish people. They uh, turned to Jesus and, and uh, accepted him as the Savior and as the Messiah. And the key to that is the truth, and the truth is the word of God. There are two things you need to be saved. You need to understand the truth of the Word of God, and you need to be uh, uh, convicted by the Holy Spirit. And if you have those two things, Jesus is saying you can be saved. And when it says the truth can set you free, what it's talking about, it can free you from sin. We're all under the yoke in the bondage of sin. I still have my old nature. I don't, I don't think it's near as bad as it used to be, but I'm still saying there are times in my life, I may not say it, I may not look, at, look like it, but I'm telling you inside, I, I, I am not who I need to be. And what he is saying is, Jesus Christ will set you free. He doesn't mean you won't sin. He's just saying you knowing Jesus, you knowing his words, you believe that you believing that he is the son of God can take, get, get you free. Free from what? Worry. Free from what? A pain. Free from what? There's so many things that the truth frees you from. In verse 33, and they answered him, we are Abraham's descents and have never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say that you will be made free? Well, folks, of all people, the Jews should have known this. In the Old Testament, seven times they were in captivity. They were slaves. They were bond slaves in Egypt. We know the story. So not only were they not listening to Jesus, they were not even looking at their own heritage. And basically the bottom line is, these Jewish leaders did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah. And folks, he is God's only begotten Son. You must believe that to be saved. Verse 34, And Jesus answered them, Most assuredly I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. Folks, you don't have to tell lost people how to sin. They know how to sin. I knew how to sin before I got saved. I can prove it to you. You tell a toddler, a toddler not to do something. Don't touch that knob there. Don't touch it. What does it do? I watch kid, toddlers, and they'll look around to see who's watching them. And then they'll turn the knob. Folks, we are born into sin, the Bible says. But we don't have to be slaves to sin. And a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son 
abides forever. And he is talking about God's house. He's talking about heaven. Therefore, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. Folks, I'm telling you, you're looking at a free man right here. A free man. I I have choice. He gives us all choices. But I'm telling you, your thought process has changed. All right? The Spirit of God inside of you changes you. He takes that old nature and He gives you that new nature. And you are free. Now here it is, verse 37. I know that you are Abraham's descendants, but you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. If they were saved, would they try to kill Jesus? Would they talk to Jesus the way they talked to Him in calling Him Beelzebub? Would they lie? Would they set up false testimonies in His own trial? See, they thought because they had a place, because they were one of the 70 of the Sanhedrin, because they carried the, these books and these robes and they could quote you scriptures right and left, they thought they were superior and even more spiritual than Jesus. Folks, I'm telling you, they were kidding themselves. I speak what I have seen with my father, and you do what you have seen with your father. What is he saying? Notice the capitalization. Jesus' father is capitalized. That's God himself. Their father is not capitalized. So it could be anybody's father, but Jesus is going to uh, show here what he is talking about. Look at verse 39. And they answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. A man after God's own heart. A man of faith. A man of faith. But now you seek to kill me. A man has told you the truth. Notice the capital M. Notice me. That's deity, Jesus, which I heard from God. Abraham did not do this. You do the deeds of your father. And they said unto him, we were not born of fornication. Folks, I'm telling you that that is a slap in Jesus' face. He was, they were just saying, we don't believe you're the son of God. We don't believe in the virgin birth. We believe Joseph or, or someone got Mary pregnant. I mean, that is a slap in Jesus' face. And it says, we have one father and it is God. Jesus said in them, if God were your father, you would love me for I proceed forth and came from God. Nor have, you, nor have I uh, come to myself, but he has sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Because you are not able to listen to my word. You are of your father, the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand for the truth. He was a liar and a murderer, folks. I'm telling you, it says when he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father. Who told the first lie in the Bible? Folks, I'm telling you, it was Satan. It, is, it was Satan. Who caused the first murder? It was Satan. All right? He influenced Cain to kill his brother. And folks, we understand here, and the reason we're here today is because we understand the truth of God's holy word. Folks, we need to follow God's Word. We need to listen to God's Word. We need to obey God's Word. We must understand God is faithful and true. Jesus Christ is the way. He is the truth. And He is the life. And the last part says, but because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me, of which convicts me of sin. If I tell you the truth, why do you not believe me? He who is of God hears God's words. Therefore, you do not hear because you are not of God. And I know it's hard scripture, folks, but I'm telling you, it's not the worst scripture that you will hear today as far as hard. Jesus really gets on them in this second point. But folks, there is false security in heritage. Just because you were born a Jew, just because your parents might have been a Christian, doesn't make you a Christian. Being good, going to church, raised in a Christian home will not get you into heaven. Number two, a false security of knowledge. Look at the rest of verse 17. Indeed, you are called a Jew and rest on the law and make your boast in God 
and know his will and approve the things that are excellent, being instructed out of the law and are confident that you yourself are a, a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness. And again, he is talking about we as man. Folks, we don't have anything to boast about, folks. We really don't. We need to be humble as Christians. We need to walk with God as Christians. And even in what he is saying here, uh, they had the law and they even taught the law. And folks, I'm telling you, uh, that's important. That is an important thing. But just teaching uh, the law doesn't make you a Christian. All right, you can be well educated and not be a Christian. Verse 20, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, having uh, the form of knowledge and the truth in the law. Folks, there are so many people. I mean, even on our televisions today and on the internet, there are people that claim to be Christians and there are people that claim to be pastors. But if you listen to these folks, it doesn't add up to what the Word of God says. We don't need to follow people's opinion. We don't need to follow man's opinion. We need to follow God. And these folks thought if these guys have the law and they are teachers, then they must be of God. But even today, folks, anybody can buy airtime. If you have the money, you can get on TV and you can preach if you choose. But we have to watch and be careful of what they are teaching. Look at this. And then Jesus asked them three questions. You therefore who teach another, do you not teach yourself? You who preach that the man should not steal, do you steal? And, and what it's saying is in their business practices, okay, they were taking advantage of people. Matter of fact, Jesus ran some of them out of the temple. Okay, he got upset and said, hey, this, this is, uh, you know, not a den of thieves. This is a house of prayer. And then he asked, who say, do not commit adultery? Do you commit adultery? You who are more idols, do you rob temples? And what they did was they would, uh, you know, buy these idols and they would resell them. They would buy them at a low price and sell them at a high price. And folks, Jesus knew all these things that were going on. <clears throat> and he was just chiding them there. Verse 23, you who make a boast in the law, do you dishonor God through the breaking of the law. Folks, what makes a person a Christian? It's a believer in Christ. What are the guidelines a Christian goes by? The Word of God. And you know what he's literally saying to these folks? You talk the talk, but you don't walk the walk. You call yourself a Christian, but these Gentiles look at what you are doing, and they know what you're doing is wrong. Folks, I know we're not perfect, but we need to, to follow Jesus in everything we do. And this next verse comes out of Ezekiel chapter 36. And I mean, it's just, it's, it's a statement that is so bold. Look what it says For the name of God is blaspheme among the Gentiles because of you. Wow. And I've heard this happen, folks. I've heard this happen, and it breaks my heart when I hear it. When I hear this word, and these words said, I thought you were a Christian. Oh, it hurts my heart. I know we mess up. I know David messed up. I know Moses messed up and didn't get to see the promised land. But folks, our talk needs to, our walk needs to, uh, to match our talk. We need to do our best as Christians to be an example for others to follow. Matter of fact, hold your finger there and go to Matthew 23. Matthew 23, and again, uh, this is Jesus speaking to the scribes and the Pharisees. Matthew 23, verse 13, five woes. And when you, when you say woe, we're not talking about horses here, okay? All right. The woe means I can't believe it. Woe, I, I can't believe what Jesus just said. Listen to Jesus' words. But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. What's a hypocrite? 
It is someone that acts. It's an actor. And they appear to be something that they are not. They are not. For you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. For you neither go in yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. What is he saying? He's saying, it's all about you. It's all about you. You don't really care who goes in and who doesn't. Your whole life is about you and being seen. And folks, the whole deal with them was being seen by men. And folks, if you want the applause of men, I'm telling you, you may go in empty-handed into heaven. You might. Verse 14, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, for you devour widows' houses, for a pretense make long prayers. You take advantage of widows. You stand on street corners and you pray. Why? To be seen by men. Therefore, you will receive a greater condemnation. Verse 15, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You travel land and sea to win one proselyte, and when he is one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourselves. Folks, Jesus is getting all over this bunch. He'd had a cup full. They'd been following him around. You have to understand, this is the latter part of Matthew. Chronologically, this has been going on for three years, and he was about to die, and he'd had it up to here with them. And he just lets them have. Uh, it was truth, folks. Jesus is truth. Now, verse, skip down. I, for time, go down to verse 25. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, for you cleanse the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of extortion and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first cleanse the inside of the cup and dish, that the outside of them may be clean also. What is he speaking about, folks? He's talking about our hearts. All right, the key, Jesus must come into your heart. You can look like a Christian. You can talk like a Christian. You can do some Christian things, but that doesn't make you a Christian. Verse 27, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees and hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear beautifully outwardly, but inside are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanliness. Even so you also outward appear righteous to men, but inside you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Oh, folks, I'm just telling you, man, he, he just got with it. Jesus just, you know, this is just chiding. And they're just saying, I know your heart. I can see your heart. Folks, Jesus could read their minds. He knew what was going to happen. He knew what they were going to say even before they said it. But yet he kept witnessing to them and kept witnessing to them and kept witnessing to them trying to make them understand religion will not save you. You need the righteousness of Jesus Christ in your life. So we see false security of heritage. We see false security of knowledge. And the third thing I want you to see is a, a false security of a ceremony. Look at verse 25 in our text. For circumcision is indeed profitable if you keep the law. But if you break her of the law, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. And we know circumcision was for the Jew, the male Jews, on the eighth day after they were born. And it was a sign. It was a covenant sign uh, with God. Uh, and, and again, we have to understand circumcision is an outside procedure. It is literally a surgery when the males are young. But he says, because you don't know Christ, it's as if it is uncircumcised. And I'm telling you, when, they, when Jesus got to this part, I bet they hit the roof about that. Because it was their identity. Because they thought it made a difference. And the whole deal in this, folks, they were not treating the Gentiles the way they should treat them. They called Gentiles uncircumcised dogs. That's what they called them. And folks, Jesus came for everyone. The, 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 the song that we sing is red, yellow, black, and white. They are precious in His sight. Folks, I believe, and I hope you believe with all your heart, everyone everywhere needs Jesus Christ. No matter what color you are, no matter what background you have, no matter what country you have come from, 
And I understand, I want immigrants to come in legally. But once they are here, it is our job as Christians to lead them to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. We should love everyone and minister to everyone. Verse 26, therefore, if an uncircumcised man keeps the righteous requirements of the law, will not his uncircumcision be counted as circumcision? What is he talking about? He's talking about the Gentiles there. The Gentiles there. Folks, I'm telling you, whether you're circumcised as a male or not has nothing to do with your spiritual, who you are in Jesus Christ. It has nothing to do with that. It's an outside thing. Folks, circumcision of the heart is what is so important. It's that change of heart. It is God putting the Holy Spirit inside of you. It is you inviting Jesus to come into your life. Verse 27, And will not the physically uncircumcised, if he fulfills the law, judge you who, even with your written code and circumcision, are transgressors of the law? What is Paul saying? They are, they are, they are saved, and you're not. Even, it has nothing to do. If, if they accept Jesus Christ into their life, and folks, I cannot tell you how big an issue this was in Paul's day. You can go back to Acts chapter 10, which we studied a few years ago, in Cornelius and all that went on there. Folks, Cornelius uh, was not a Jew, but yet Peter came to say, hey, Christ is no respecter of person. God loves everyone uh, unconditionally. Verse 28, for he is, he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that one is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew he, who is one inwardly. And understand, in the Old Testament, they had to have faith in a coming Messiah. That's what amazes me with religion today, folks. The religion today just, and we almost make it too easy sometimes. Okay, Christ died for us, folks. You know, we just, we, we call it a sinner's prayer, which I don't have a problem with, but it's more than that, folks. It's surrendering your total life to Jesus Christ. It is dying to self. It is realizing there's no way I can get to heaven on my own. I can't clean up enough. I can't do enough. I can't memorize enough. I can't read my Bible enough to get me there. Folks, I'm telling you, there are atheists that read Bibles. And you know why they read them? So that they can refute what you are trying to say. And this is what he is saying. He's saying, it's not a Jew and Gentile thing here. It's are you saved? Are you right with God? Has there ever been a time in your life where you truly surrendered everything to God? And God changed your life. That's what Jesus, and that's what Paul is saying here. But he is a Jew, is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart in the Spirit. Oh, folks, that's what true salvation is. 2 Corinthians 5.17 Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. It is in the heart, in the spirit, not in the letter, who praise is not from men, but from God. Even the word Jews, Jews comes from the word Judah, which literally means praise. Folks, you can even sing songs. I was in Lawton, Oklahoma, and a lady was singing a special before the church. And I'll never forget this in my life. And she, she sang a special. And then the evangelist preached a sermon called The Wheat and the Tears, and it was Bailey Smith. Matter of fact, I was saved under Bailey Smith ministry because of The Wheat and the Tears. And during the invitation time, I'll never forget it, all right, she literally almost ran down the aisle with tears in her eyes. And she testified after the church that I sang a song, but I simply sang from my head. I really don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And she got saved that day. 
it beat anything I've ever seen. And also, J. Harold Smith would come through. Three times he came to Cameron Baptist Church. One Sunday, uh, I'm telling you, he came and 72 people got saved in one Sunday. It was incredible. The church service lasted till 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Some walked out, not many. But I'm telling you, it literally changed the direction of our church. So today, as we look at the Word of God, and again, we're running out of time. Galatians 5, if you want to know more about circumcision and what God thinks, look at Galatians 5. Circle that on your bulletin and read it later on. But folks, we're not talking about circumcision here today. We are talking about if you were to die today, would you go to heaven? I hope so. I hear that a lot, folks. Well, folks, hope so is not going to get you into heaven. I'm telling you, Jesus died on the cross for your sins. Jesus rose again after three days. And that if you'll put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, today you can be saved. One last scripture, Matthew 7. Go with me to Matthew 7. I want you to see this. Oh, I love to hear those pages turning. I know we got them on the board, but I like the pages. Matthew 7, verse 21. Now this is Jesus' words. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. Because a lot of people say, well, I prayed a prayer when I was five. or Folks, I prayed a prayer when I was six. I prayed a prayer when I was 14. And all I got was dumped. All I got was wet. But when I prayed the salvation prayer at 22, God totally changed my life. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father. Folks, there's the key. Are you following Christ? Are you doing His will? Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Folks, prophecy is preaching. All right, it is a sad day, but I'm telling you, there are preachers that are not going to heaven. Okay, they have to go just like you and I, folks. They have to go through the blood of Jesus Christ. Cast out demons in your name. Done many wonders in your name. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Folks, I think that's for the saddest words in the Word of God. Those that are coming from Jesus' mouth. Man, I don't know you. I don't know you. And the Bible says, depart from me, ye who practice lawlessness. Then the last scripture, verse 13. Go back to verse 13. Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go by it. Why do you have narrow gates? Because not a lot are going. Why do you have broad gates? because a lot of people are going. Verse 14, because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads into life, and there are few who find it. So today, the invitation is this. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, if you are not sure, if you're not 100% sure that you're going to heaven, I pray that you would just come and talk to one of us ministers it is the greatest and the most important decision you'll ever make in your life. And to the Christian, folks, we can be Christians on Sunday. Sitting here today, I'm just telling you, y'all all look like Christians to me. You're in God's house. You've got a Bible in your hand. But what about Monday through Saturday? Are you the same during the week as you are on Sundays in let me take that even a step further. We, as Christians, are supposed to, we have been given the assignment to reach the world for Jesus Christ. Are we actively engaging in evangelism? Are we actively sharing our testimonies with others? Whatever God tells you, this is God's invitation. This is God speaking to you today. I pray that you would obey. Father, thank you for the day. And God, I thank you for your word. God, it's not my word. It's your word. It's Jesus' word. I quoted Jesus more than anyone today. And it's his word. So God, I pray, Lord, that in this moment, in this time, that we will forget 
about what's going on around us, that we will not think ahead any at all, but that we'll simply draw a circle around ourselves and ask God, God, tell me, what do I need to do? And God, I pray that they would obey. God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your love. I thank you for your patience. God, I thank you for your mercy and your grace. And God, I pray if there's one here that doesn't know you, today would be their day of salvation. Maybe rededication for a Christian is needed. Or following the Lord in baptism. They've been saved, but you've never been scripturally baptized. Or even joined this church by letter or statement. God, I pray that you would just speak to these folks. They're yours. They're yours. So God, thank you. Thank you for this day. God, we love you. We praise you. And we give you glory for everything that is done this day. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. Would you stand to your feet? If God has spoken to you, would you come today? We thank you for joining us this morning at Rahel Baptist Church. And may God richly bless you.